What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and welcome to week three of my weekly NFL pick show for the 2016-2017 NFL season. And kids, we're having a pretty successful season. And that's not to sound braggadocious, that is not the kind of person that I am, but I am a firm believer in celebrating successes, and week two was yet another success, just like week one was, we did really, really well. Straight up, I went 11-5 and in week two, that's to go with 12-4 and in week one. I am 23 up, 9 down so far on the season, picking the game straight up. I think that's an excellent mark. It's almost three out of every four games, and that's definitely where you want to be. So 23 up, nine down. Hey, we did really well. Against the spread, it's still a coin flip. We're still kind of treading water against the spread. I only went eight and eight once again in week two, which means I'm 16 and 16 so far against the spread on the season. We're looking to turn that around here in week three. Another really good week over under, which once again, I really struggle over under, but a great week in week two over under. I went 10 and 6. I'm now 21, 10 and 1 over under on the season that's unbelievable if you had asked me at the beginning of the season like one of your props is going to be 16 and 16 the other one's going to be 21 10 and 1 which one's ats and which one's over under never in a million years would i have thought the 21 10 and 1 would be well either of them but certainly over under but 21 10 and 1 over under we're only 16 and 16 against the spread but a fantastic 23 and 9 picking the game straight up Taking a look at the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks from last week. Another successful week in those picks as well. Starting in the bronze pick, I told you to take Denver over Indianapolis. Won that one straight up. Denver winning that game 34-20. to I told you to take Denver minus 6 on the line. So that's an against the spread win in the bronze pick. And I told you to take over 45 points. That is a win over under. So I swept the bronze pick, which is great because in week one, I completely whiffed on the bronze pick. So it was nice to sweep it in week two. On the silver pick, I told you to take the Jets to beat Buffalo. That worked out. That was a really fun game to watch on Thursday night. Jets win that game 37-31, to a high-scoring shootout there, winning for the Jets. I also won that game against the spread because that game, when I picked it, was a pick em. So I had the Jets as a pick em, so I won that one against the spread. The over-under didn't do so well. I told you to take under 40 points, and that ended up being a total blowout. So that's a loss there. It flew, obviously, over 40 points. The gold pick, I told you to take the Giants straight up to beat New Orleans. They did that, but a much closer and a much lower scoring game than I and a lot of other people expected in that one. The Giants win that game on home turf 16-13, to so that worked out straight up. But against the spread and over under, I lost on both of them. I told you to take the Giants minus five. They only won by three, so that's an against the spread loss. And I told you to take over 52 and a half, which was the biggest gaffe of the week because they only scored 29 points. So yikes, that was a definite loss there. And the platinum pick, won it straight up, told you to take Carolina over San Francisco. They won that game comfortably, 46 to 27. I did tell you to take San Francisco plus 13 and a half because I thought that was too many points. Unfortunately, that doesn't work out. Uh, they won that game by 19, so that's an against the spread loss. And another over under loss, unfortunately, because I told you to stay under 48 and a half points, and that flew into the 70s. So that was a loss as well. So with the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze, I swept them straight up 4 and 0. Fantastic. I'm now 7 and 1 on the season on those picks. Against the spread, I only went 2-2. Two and two. I got the silver and the bronze, lost the gold and the platinum. And over-under, unfortunately, only went 1-3 and three on that one, only got the bronze pick. But that was three of my six over-under losses last week. In week two came the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. But as a whole, still a successful week. Taking a look now at both the straight up and against the spread private pick em pools. We'll start in the straight up pool. I currently sit in sixth place out of 28 managers in that pool with 196 out of 272 possible confidence points on the season. That's a clip of 72% and I feel real good in sixth place where I am right now 
after two weeks. In week two, I brought in 95 of 136 possible confidence points. That's a clip of 70%. And once again, anytime you're up in that 70% range, you're going to be competitive every week, week in and week out for not only winning a week, but staying towards the top of the league. Shout out to our week two winner and overall leader, in a minute man and you're going to hear that name again uh in a minute man went 11 and 5 last week as i did managed his confidence points a little bit better 104 out of 136 possible confidence points for in a minute man in week two that's a clip of 76 percent 75 percent hey look at that anywhere in that range that's fantastic and again, in a minute, man, our overall leader, 24 and 8 straight up on the season. So one better than I am so far. 211 out of 272 possible confidence points for a season clip of 78%. That's incredible. Expect that number to come down. But shout out to in a minute, man, for winning week two and being the overall leader in the straight up pool. In the against the spread pool, I'm also in sixth place. Sixth out of 19 managers in that pool. Uh, 16 and th- uh, 16 and 16 on the season, as I mentioned earlier. 16 out of 32. That's a clip of 50%. Went eight and eight in week two, so I was eight for 16. That's another 50%. Shout out to both Gundy and Savin Ryan's privates for co-winning week two. They both went 10 and six against the spread. In week two, that's a clip of 63%. So Gundy and Savin Ryan's privates both going 10 and 6. Should have been Savin or uh yeah, should have been Savin Ryan's privates to win. Unfortunately, he lost, I believe, the Sunday nighter and the Monday nighter, which allowed Gundy to kind of slip in there and take the co-victory in week two. And shout out once again to In a Minute Man, who is also leading the against the spread pool. Holy cow, what a great start to the season for In A Minute Man, who's been in my pools for the last couple of years, I believe. 21 and 11 against the spread so far on the season. That's unreal. That's a great clip there. That's a clip of 66%. And hey, two out of three ain't bad. So shout out to Gundy and Saving Ryan's Privates for co-winning week two. And to In A Minute Man for now leading both of our private pick'em pools. Let's head over to Fantasy Corner for a minute and take a look at how my fantasy football teams did in week two. Between my eight teams, I went six and two, and that's much more like it. That's much more what we're looking for as the season progresses. In the NFL YouTube Prognosticators Fantasy Football League, I had a win in week two over Bad News Bears. I was projected to win that matchup. It really wasn't particularly close for most of the week, but shout out to Bad News Bears for a good matchup in week two. That now evens my record at one and one. In week three, I am up against Chalupa Batman, who I believe is 2-0 and in the league, and that is a projected loss for me. Chalupa Batman had the best uh, projected draft by Yahoo, like kind of tied for the best or whatever, most points, what, however you want to judge it. But Chalupa Batman is my week three opponent. It's a projected loss. I'm hoping to pull the upset victory. So shout out to Bad News Bears for the week two matchup. And shout out to Chalupa Batman. Chalupa, bring it on in week three. That's going to be a fun matchup for me. But six and two overall in week two for my fantasy teams. Had a great week, except that uh, on a couple of teams, my running backs got demolished. One team, for instance, had both Adrian Peterson and Jonathan Stewart. And it looks like both of them are going to be missing some time. And I'll take this opportunity, as I do every week, to remind you that if you're watching, listening to the show on YouTube, in the description to the video, you're going to find all of my results from week two, all of my straight up against the spread and over under picks in week three. You're going to find information on joining the Bridgewater's Finest Pick'em Pools for season five of the show. You're going to find links to the NFL YouTube Prognosticators Facebook page, as well as links to other high quality NFL YouTube prognosticators that get out there and do this every single week. Everybody seems to be having a really successful start to the season in terms of viewership and their picks seem to be doing quite well as well. So it's it's the glory days right now for the NFL YouTube prognosticators. You can get in on the show as well. Again, get on the NFL YouTube prognosticators Facebook page. We're active all through the week talking NFL football, talking college football, talking all kinds of stuff. So get on the Facebook page. You can find that information in the YouTube description below. If you're on SoundCloud, search NFL YouTube prognosticators on Facebook. Get in on the fun. All right. 
Two straight successful weeks. Can we make it three? Let's look at the week three picks. Let's start in New England where the Patriots, the surprisingly 2-0 and o Patriots, are hosting the Houston Texans. Now, this is a really interesting game because no Tom Brady, obviously, we knew that. What we didn't know was that there was going to be no Jimmy Garoppolo. He's injured, shoulder injury. He's going to be probably, he probably won't see another snap on the field this season unless something happens to Brady once he comes back. That means for the Patriots, this is Jacoby Brissett's football team for the next two weeks until Tom Brady comes back. Now, good news for Jacoby Brissett. He is likely to be getting Rob Gronkowski back. Gronk has missed the first two weeks of action. Really good chance that they get Gronk back this week. Uh, It's not a sure thing, but there's a pretty good chance that he probably should be back for week three. But... Again, no Brady, no Garoppolo. This is where we're really going to find out if, when it comes to New England, if it is just a system thing or if it's one of those things where you can't just plug anybody in there. Brissett, obviously, when he came into the Week 2 game, the offense took a notable, notable downtick. Uh, Miami couldn't quite mount the full comeback, but the offense took a definite downtick. They really got conservative just trying to hold on to that lead that they had. The Houston Texans are by no means an offensive juggernaut. They're right around the middle of the league in terms of points scored as well as total offensive yards. That defense, though, not enough people are talking about that defense. Now, they're only giving up 178.5 yards per game through the air. They're giving up less than 100 yards per game on the ground. They're only giving up an average of 13 points per per game in the first two games this season those are all like top three top five numbers this Texans defense is something to worry about and especially with uh, you know a guy back there who's going to be making his first career start at quarterback this is a real dangerous game for the New England Patriots and I think the Texans are going to win this thing I like Houston on the road in Gillette Stadium to beat the New England Patriots. Say it again, I like the Texans to go into Gillette Stadium and beat the Patriots. I'm taking Houston for the first pick so far this week, and it starts as maybe a bit of a shocker, I guess. There's this there's this idea that that like I'm this huge Patriots fan, as I've mentioned before, and I'll say again, I don't have a team. I just like good football. I don't dislike really any team. I have my teams that I usually pick for and my teams that I usually pick against. I don't usually pick against the Patriots because I don't like losing. But this is one of those situations where if New England's going to lose one of these first four games, I think it's going to be this one. So I like the Texans to go into New England, beat the Patriots on the line. Houston actually favored by two and a half points in this game. There's no way they'd be a favorite if that was Jimmy Garoppolo in there. But it is not Jimmy Garoppolo in there. So I'm going to take Houston minus two and a half as the favorite on the road. Again, betting against the Patriots in Gillette Stadium, it seems like it's a fool's errand. But I really like the Texans here. I think the Texans have a great chance to win this game straight up. Two and a half points is not too many. So Houston minus two and a half. The line here, the total is only 40 and a half. That's a low total. I'm going to go over on that one because even though Houston's defense is good, I still think New England is going to get their points in this one, whether it's through Edelman or, you know, Gronk if he's back or LeGarrette Blount, the run game is good. So I think New England's going to get their points. I just think Houston is going to come out on top in this one by at least three points. So take over 40 and a half, take Houston minus two and a half, and the Houston Texans straight up to beat the Patriots. Let's go to Buffalo now where the underwhelming Bills are hosting the Arizona Cardinals who again lost that surprise week one matchup against New England uh, in Arizona. I don't think there's going to be any such surprises uh, this week. I really like the Arizona Cardinals in this game. I think Tyrod Taylor is going to be able to put up numbers on the Cardinals because I feel like their defense, while it's supposed to be very good and it is very good, the defense has not particularly performed 
up to the level expected so far this season. Now, look, they've only given up an average uh, less than 100 yards on the ground per game, but it seems like teams are able to throw on that defense, on that secondary so far this season. They're giving up an average of 239 yards against through the air. And look, that's not terrible. That's around middle of the pack in the league, but you kind of expect that secondary to be better. So I think Tyrod Taylor is going to be able to put up numbers. I just don't think it's going to be enough. Even though the game is in Buffalo, this is going to be a very rough start to the season for the Buffalo Bills. I like Arizona to win this game. On the line, Arizona is a favorite by four points on the road. Going to tell you to take your second straight road favorite here in the games we've looked at. I like Arizona minus four. It's not too many to give up as far as I'm concerned. So Arizona minus four on the line. Over under in this game is set at 47. I like the under in that one. It's two defenses that can play well. 47, it's kind of in that gray area of where you might take the over, you might take the under. For whatever reason, I just, I'm feeling the under in that game. So, I like Arizona straight up to beat Buffalo. I like Arizona minus four, and I like under 47 points. And after I thought the Buffalo Bills were really going to do something this season, I expect them to start 0-3. Let's go to Cincinnati now, where the Denver Broncos will finally be leaving the friendly confines and heading on the road to take on the Bengals in Ohio. Despite losing last week against Pittsburgh, Cincinnati is actually, so far on the season, an elite passing offense. They've put up the number two passing offense right now in football, 345 yards through the air per game. That's pretty fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Andy Dalton having himself an excellent little season. It hasn't particularly translated to points on the board. It's a lot of yards, but it's not a ton of points. They only rank 20th, actually tied for 20th with the Washington Redskins in terms of points put on the board so far this season. And a large part of that is because they can't get the run game going. They have, in fact, the second worst rush offense in football so far this year Second worst only to Minnesota, where Adrian Peterson has had such monumental struggles and, of course, is now injured uh, in Minnesota. So Cincinnati really can't get that run game going, which is a a surprise to me. Now, look, they faced two really good run defenses so far this season. I get that. They faced the Jets and they faced the Steelers. Both of those teams are, are built defensively on stopping the run. I understand that. But when you have Jeremy Hill and Giovanni Bernard, you'd think at some point across eight quarters, you'd figure out a way to get that run game going. They haven't been able to do that so far. And I'm not 100% sure that they're going to be able to do it this week against Denver. So you take the number two pass offense. That's great. They're putting up tons of yardage. Okay, do it against one of the best secondaries in football. Now, look, I understand this is Denver's first game not being played in Denver. I get that. And that makes a difference. That is a huge difference. Cincinnati's a good home team. Denver, we haven't seen them on the road yet this season. So we don't particularly know what is going to happen taking them out of Denver and putting them on the road. We can only speculate based on last season, and most of last season was with a different quarterback. It will be really interesting to see how Trevor Simeon, who again, I'm going to spend all season not really particularly pronouncing his name right, but it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to not playing in front of the home crowd. This will be basically the first time in his career that he'll have done that. So interesting storylines heading into this game. I still like Denver. I, I love that defense until someone proves it otherwise. Like that defense to me is just, Excuse me. That defense is just incredible. Second best pass defense in football so far on the season. Second only to the Baltimore Ravens. Um, You are able to run on their defense, to be perfectly honest. They rank in the bottom third of the league so far in terms of the rush defense. So maybe Cincinnati gets the run game going this week. I would expect that they probably do. I think there's going to be points put up on both sides here. But I like the Broncos until proven otherwise. I'm going to take the Broncos on the road to beat the Bengals in Cincinnati. 
Now on the line, Cincinnati three-point favorite at home. But since I like Denver to win the game straight up, I'm going to tell you to go Denver plus three on the line. Even if you like Cincinnati in this game, I think you give Denver's defense and their offense, their rush offense, which is, again, one of the best in football right now. C.J. Anderson is just rolling so far this season. So I think you give that defense... And the run offense, the benefit of the doubt, like Denver's top five in terms of run offense. So even if you like Cincinnati in this game, I would say it's a good idea on the line to hedge your bets. So I'm going to tell you to take Denver plus three on the line. There is no total so far in this game. It has not been released yet, just like last week with uh, Seattle and Los Angeles, I believe. There is no line, but my initial lean is whatever the line is when it comes out, take the under in this one. Because I imagine this is going to be a run battle. It's two defenses that can play very well, both in terms of the secondary and in terms of stopping the run. So my lean on this one is to take the under, whatever it is. I'll, of course, update the line when it comes out in the description in the YouTube video. So... I like Denver to beat Cincinnati. I like Denver plus three on the line. And I like under whatever the total is. Let's go to Tennessee now where the Titans are going to play host to the Oakland Raiders. Not a great start to the season, of course, for Tennessee. I mean, they are one and one. They did win last week. But again, not a great start to the season when you're a team that is, you know, you're in second place in your division, but you are giving up. Actually, in that division, there's only one team that has scored more points than they've allowed and that's the Houston Texans but you know when you're one and one but you know you're giving up more points than you're scoring not a great start to the season obviously could have been worse just look at Indianapolis and Jacksonville but the same can of course be said for the Oakland Raiders they are also one and one and they are also giving up more points than they're scoring not a ton it's only six points but it's only eight points for Tennessee so again meeting of two teams they're both off to good not great starts they're both off to acceptable starts given that these are two franchises that have really struggled in recent history so you know what one and one why not we'll take it i'm being too hard on them oakland really putting up the points this season really giving up the points this season oakland's an exciting team to watch we'll put it that way in terms of scoring oakland in the number three team in football right now averaging 31 and a half points across their two games but they're also giving up 34 and a half you take a look at tennessee bit of a different story their offense obviously not putting up the numbers so far this season only 16 points per game but defensively tennessee ranking inside the top 10 tied for ninth giving up 20 points per game really i think the difference here comes down to the offenses and i obviously love oakland's offense a lot more than i love tennessee's tennessee's really struggling even though they should have a really fantastic run game with the two running backs that they have there demarco murray and derrick henry they should have a really really solid run game it's good not great it's right around middle of the pack they are averaging just over 100 yards on the ground per game but it's not really translating to the points. A lot of that, of course, can be blamed on certain struggles through the air, only putting up 238 points or 238 yards on average per game is Marcus Mariota. Tennessee's secondary is really going to be challenged by Derek Carr and those very talented Oakland Raiders receivers. Latavius Murray is off to a good start this season. That, I think, is going to be the difference. I think Murray is going to be able to keep the game moving on the ground, keep the chains moving on the ground, and then I think it's going to be Derek Carr and those wide receivers taking over the game on the offensive side. I like Oakland in this one on the road. I think the Raiders beat the Titans. On the line, Oakland is a point and a half underdog on the road, Tennessee point and a half favorite at home. That's close enough for me. Since I like Oakland straight up, I'm going to tell you to go Oakland plus a point and a half on the line. The total here is 47 points. I actually kind of like that to go over. I think Tennessee can get it going, obviously, with Oakland and their struggles so far, keeping other teams out of the end zone. So I think Tennessee is going to put up their points. I just think Oakland's going to put up more. So 47 points, actually like the over in that one. So we're going to go Oakland straight up over Tennessee, Oakland plus a point and a half, and over 47 points. All right, New York Giants, Washington Redskins. Going to be real quick on this one. NFC East matchup. It's in New York. I like the Giants. Kirk Cousins is getting 
pounded so far this season. Matt Jones kind of starting to pick it up a little bit on the ground for the Redskins, but I still don't trust that Redskins secondary any farther than I could throw them, which is not very far. Just ask my friend who throws the football around with me every summer. The Giants should have been able to put up points last week against the Saints. They didn't. They will be able and will put up points this week on the Redskins secondary. They still can't figure out how to play defense, especially in that secondary. They might be able to stop the Giants' run game, although, again, Rashad Jennings and uh, Shane Vereen, they've got good running backs there. But, I, I mean, I like the Giants all day in this one. I don't think this is going to be close, even though it is a divisional matchup. I like the Giants straight up at home. To beat the Redskins, have Washington start off 0-3. Giants are favored by 4.5 points at home here. I like that. It's not too many as far as I'm concerned. So take the Giants minus 4.5 over Washington. The total in this game, 46.5 points. I like the over in that one. So I'm going to tell you to go over 46.5 points. Giants straight up. Giants minus 4.5 over 46.5. Let's go to Carolina now where the Minnesota Vikings are in town to take on the Panthers. And this is the first line so far this week that I think is just criminal and it's Vegas handing you money. So here's the deal with this game. Both teams have starting running backs that are tremendously likely to miss this game. Adrian Peterson, Torres Meniscus. It's not an ACL tear, which is great in terms of if you're going to tear something in your knee, the meniscus probably your best bet let's be perfectly honest uh so adrian peterson obviously not going to be playing this week although the vikings coaching staff is oh you know there's a chance no he tore his meniscus he's not playing for carolina jonathan stewart is not likely to be playing in this game either he's expected to probably miss a couple of weeks after being banged up last week. So you've got a running back matchup of Jarek McKinnon or Matt Asiata, whoever the Vikings decide they want to give the ball to, taking on Fozzie Whitaker. So the run game in this game, I think, is going to be all based on Cam Newton. I like Carolina to win this game. Minnesota's defense is very good. Minnesota's defense cannot win every game for them. So I like Carolina in this one. However, on the line, Carolina's favored by seven and a half points, and that's Vegas overreacting to the fact that Adrian Peterson is not going to be playing in this game. Sure, but Jonathan Stewart's not going to be playing in this game either. Greg Olson, to me, looks like he's a little banged up and doesn't quite have the chemistry on Cam as he had last season. Look, they still got chemistry. Let's 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 not let's not uh, confuse the issue here, but. He's not putting up the numbers that I think were expected that he would have been putting up so far in the season, especially with Carolina being, I think, the top scoring offense in football right now. I like Minnesota's ability to keep this game close, and Carolina's favored by seven and a half points. That's way too many in a game that Minnesota could sneak up on them and win, even though it's in Carolina. So I like Carolina straight up, but take Minnesota plus seven and a half on that line all day before that line creeps down to maybe five and you start kind of getting into that gray area there minnesota plus seven and a half hammer that line while you can total in that game is 43 i like it to stay under i think they're going to be able to keep cam in check i think this is going to be a trench battle these are two good defenses 43 points to me is too many so i'll tell you to go under so carolina beats minnesota minnesota plus seven and a half on the line under 43 points let's go to jacksonville now where the jags welcome the ravens into jacksonville florida i'm going to try to speed things up here a little bit and honestly i think what this comes down to is jacksonville looked really good at home against green bay sure they lost that game they've lost both games but i thought they looked really good they almost beat green bay in that game and that's the only home game that we kind of have to go on. That was only a four-point game. I like Jacksonville here. Baltimore is suspect to me on the road. I've talked about it before. Now, sure, they won their only road game so far this season. And just taking a look at the score in that game, that was the come-from-behind win. But they were down 20-2 to at one point, I believe, in that game against Cleveland. So this is a team that is suspect on the road. And if they were playing any team that wasn't the Browns, They probably wouldn't have won that game. So, 
I like Jacksonville here. Jacksonville, a one-point dog at home right now on the line. Take Jacksonville plus one. Take Jacksonville straight up. Total in this game is set at 47 and a half. I like the under in that ga- in uh, that total. So we're going to go Jacksonville straight up over Baltimore. Jacksonville plus one and under 47 and a half. Let's go to Seattle now. NFC West matchup between the Seahawks and the San Francisco 49ers. San Francisco looked impressive in week one, looked not quite so impressive in week two. But hey, one win through the first two games, I think San Francisco will take that. Matter of fact, San Francisco is currently co-leading the NFC West because all four teams are one and one. But hey, if you would have told anybody in the San Francisco organization that the 49ers would have more net points after two weeks than both the Rams and the Seahawks, they'd have taken that in a big bad way. The only thing I will say about San Francisco is this. San Francisco's got to think about putting Colin Kaepernick in a game. I'm sorry. You can hate him all you want for the politics and, and whatever, the hair, whatever you want. The stupid shit that has come up that people have used to talk down Colin Kaepernick just because they don't like the fact that he's talking about politics and he's doing he's doing something that is politically motivated. A lot of people just plain don't like that. They've got to think about putting Colin Kaepernick in a game here. Blaine Gabbert's only put up 203 and a half yards per game in the first two games. Look, San Francisco's run offense has been pretty well, perfectly fine so far this season. They're averaging over 100 yards per game on the ground. But you put Kaepernick in there, that run game gets better because he's always a threat to run where Gabbert, not that he's not a threat to run, but he's not as much of a threat to run as Kaepernick is. And I think Kaepernick's a better passing quarterback than Gabbard is. And the numbers are reflected through the first two weeks. San Francisco, number 28 in the league right now in terms of pass yards. Uh, Only Chicago, Buffalo, Green Bay, shockingly, and Los Angeles are lower than San Francisco. So San Francisco's got to think about putting Kaepernick in a game. However, I don't think they put him in this week. And I certainly like Seattle to win the game in Seattle, even though Seattle cannot figure out their run game to save their soul. Russell Wilson looks fine to me. I don't see any way that San Francisco wins this game. However, Seattle favored by nine and a half points at home when they don't have a run game really to speak of at this point. I don't like that. So I actually like San Francisco plus nine and a half on the line in that game, even though I like Seattle to win the game straight up. Total in that game is 40 and a half points. I like the under in that one. I think it's going to be a classic NFC West trench battle run game. Just just the lines just running into each other and trying to run the ball one way, trying to run the ball the other way. Defensive football all day. 40 and a half points, even though I believe it is the smallest number that we're going to look at this week. In fact, it is. I like the under in that one. So... Seattle beats San Francisco straight up. San Francisco plus nine and a half on the line and under 40 and a half points. All right, final four before we get to the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. Let's get through them. Rams at Bucks, LA traveling to Tampa Bay. I like the Rams in this one and it completely comes down to defense. The Bucks are only averaging 19 points per game through the first two games. The offense looked good in the first week, did not look good at all in the second week and they absolutely got destroyed. And I like the Rams defensively to completely keep Tampa Bay in check. Who knows what Doug Martin's status is going to be. He was uh, injured in week two. He could be limited in week three. I like the Rams defensively. Now, look, the Rams have only put up nine points in the first two games. All right. They've got the worst offense in football right now from a points perspective. That's not the point. The Bucs are the only team in football who are straight up leading their division who have a negative in terms of net points. They've allowed 64 points in two games. The Rams are going to be able to score this week. Todd Gurley finally gets off the schneid, has himself a big game. The Bucs aren't going to be able to stop him. The Rams are going to be able to stop the Bucs. So I like LA straight up on the road to beat Tampa Bay. On the line, Tampa Bay, four and a half point favorite at home. How? That's ridiculous to me. Los Angeles plus four and a half on the line. That is easy money. Take it where you can. Total for this game is 42 points. I like the under because honestly, I'll be surprised if if the Bucs get 14 points 
I'll be surprised. If the Bucks score a touchdown, I'll be surprised. No, I shouldn't say that. They'll score one. They won't score two. They'll score one. But I like the Rams in this one all day. So Rams beat the Bucks on the road. Rams plus four and a half on the line, under 42 in the total. Kansas City playing host to the New York Jets. Again, this comes down to where the game is. Kansas City, very difficult team to play at home. Jets traditionally not great on the road, although they did win their one road game so far uh, this season. But I like Kansas City here. Maybe Kansas City gets Jamal Charles back. If not, Spencer Ware has been good so far this season. The Jets have a very difficult defense to play against. So does Kansas City. The Jets are going to be able to run on the Chiefs, but the Chiefs are going to be able to throw on the Jets. I like Kansas City at home to beat the Jets. On the line, Kansas City favored by three points at home. That's not too many. I'll say take that. Kansas City minus three against the spread. Total for this game is 43 and a half. I'm actually going to tell you to go over on that. It's a relatively low number. Relatively is is in quotation marks, but 43 and a half, I just kind of, that's a gut. You know what? I'm going to call that what it is. That's a gut feeling, but I'm going to go over 43 and a half. So Kansas City beats the Jets at home. Kansas City minus three on the line over 43 and a half points. Battle of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia playing host to Pittsburgh. This is going to be a fun game. And it's officially time for me to get off the Philadelphia's defense hate train that I've been on for the first two weeks. I've mentioned it in the week one episode and the week two episode. I can't do it anymore. Philadelphia's defense has played extremely well in these first two weeks. They're only giving up 12 points a game, under 100 yards per game on the ground, under 200 yards per game through the air. The Philadelphia defense has showed up to play so far this season. Carson Wentz has been very good so far this season. And you know what? Yeah, sure, it's the Browns and the Bears, but to be perfectly honest, the Browns should be able to have a better offense this season than they do. Philly still stopped them. You still have to, as Ray Lewis has said, you got to buckle up the chin straps. You still got to play. And that's what Philadelphia has done. And on the defensive side of the ball, Philadelphia has been fantastic. So I'm officially calling a moratorium on the Philadelphia's defense is suspect argument. They're not suspect anymore. They're playing very well. Pittsburgh also playing surprisingly well. That's a defense that is kind of a coin flip. They could have been good or they could have been terrible, but they're playing fairly well right now. They're inside the top 10 in terms of uh, points allowed. The run defense, they are right now the second best run defense in football behind only Green Bay. So they've got a big shot here to stop that Philadelphia run attack with Ryan Matthews and Darren Sproles. They used it very effectively last night on Monday night. In terms of the offense, Pittsburgh can run the ball. We all know that even though Le'Veon Bell is not in there, Pittsburgh's still able to run the ball. They can also put the ball up through the air inside the top half of the league in terms of pass offense. We know that Pittsburgh can put up the points, and we know that Philadelphia on the offensive side have not really put up the yardage that Pittsburgh has. But in terms of the points, they're translating sort of a less with more or more with less, or uh, yeah, more with less. That would make sense. Philadelphia averaging 29 points per game. So Carson Wentz in that Philadelphia offense, they're getting it done. This is going to be a really, really fun game. And this is the first game where I'm really, really hedging my bets because I'm really not sure what way this game is going to go. I like Pittsburgh. I think Pittsburgh's a good enough team to win this game. I like Pittsburgh on the road to beat Philadelphia, even though it's technically really not on the road because it's within the same state. I like Philly plus five on the line. Five points, too many for me. I think this is going to be a real close game. I think it's going to come down to a Chris Boswell field goal to win this game. So Pittsburgh straight up, but I like Philly plus five on the line. The total, 46 points. I like the over in this one. I think it's two offenses that can get it done. I think... Pittsburgh's going to be able to put up points on that Philadelphia defense. I think Philadelphia is going to be able to put up points on that Pittsburgh defense. 46 points. It's not too many for me. So Pittsburgh beats Philly straight up. Philly plus five on the line. Hedge your bets there in a big, bad way and over 46 points. 
And the last game we're going to look at before we get into the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze is the Atlanta Falcons traveling to New Orleans to play the Saints. And this is another game where I have to hedge my bets on Monday night because this game could go either way. I've said that I expect the Saints to be a good team at home. They lost their first home game, and I thought they were going to be 7-1. and one. So I still believe that the New Orleans Saints are going to be a good home team. So when you look at this and you look at the Falcons who don't tend to travel well, even though they won their first road game. So it's, it's, it's one of those situations where it's a game that is a true, true coin flip. I like the Saints to win this game. I think the Saints are too good to be 0-3. Remember that statement. It's going to come back again in one of the games we're going to look at in the PGSB. I think the Saints are too good to be 0-3. But I don't think that strongly enough to take the minus three on the line. I like Atlanta plus three. I'm going to hedge my bets there in a big bad way because Atlanta, again, it's a coin flip. I think Atlanta's got a 50-50 shot to win this game. Matt Ryan has been playing lights out for the Falcons. They're the top passing offense in football. In terms of scoring, they are inside the top 10, firmly inside the top 10 in terms of points per game. Defensively, neither of these teams can play defense. <laughs> you can run on New Orleans. You can run on Atlanta. You can pass on New Orleans. You can pass on Atlanta. It's two good offenses, two of the top offenses in football, two of the top quarterbacks in football. Yeah, I said it. Matt Ryan deserves to be in that conversation. Sure, he's had Roddy White and Julio Jones and Tony Gonzalez over his career. Who cares? He deserves to be in that conversation. So this is the biggest total that we're going to look at as well this week, 53 and a half points. I like the over in that. This game is a true coin flip. We don't know how it's going to go. So... I like New Orleans straight up. I am hedging my bets and taking Atlanta plus three. And I like over 53 and a half in what should be head and shoulders the most entertaining game of week three. Set your DVRs for this one. I think it's going to be an offensive explosion. A reminder, I also said the same thing last week about New Orleans and the Giants. All right, guys, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks. Let's get into it. We're going to start, of course, with the bronze pick, as we always do. I'm one and one across the board in the bronze pick. One and one straight up, one and one against the spread, one and one over under after sweeping the bronze pick in week two after completely whiffing on it in week one. My bronze pick for week three comes in the Cleveland Browns traveling to Miami to take on the Dolphins. I love the Dolphins in this game. And you know what? I've given too much slack to the Cleveland Browns because I thought as we was kind of talked up all preseason, oh, their offense, it's going to be much better. Corey Coleman, Duke Johnson, Josh Gordon coming back. I mean, of course, I know Josh Gordon's not back until week five because he's on suspension, but and you know, Robert Griffin III and Gary Barnage and they've got weapons. I've been one of the biggest horn blowers for that, saying, look, this team's got weapons. This team's going to be good this year. No, they're not. They're the Cleveland Browns. Sorry. They're the Cleveland Browns. They are not a good football team. They're the Cleveland Browns. They're traveling to Miami to play an underrated quarterback in Ryan Tannehill. They almost came back last week against the Patriots. Now, granted, that was after the Jimmy Garoppolo injury. Jimmy Garoppolo totally destroyed the Dolphins' defense. So, I'm not saying that this is going to be a total walk in the park for Miami, but it's going to be mostly a walk in the park for Miami. Cleveland is starting their fifth. Just sit down. Just, just, just listen to this ridiculous fact. The Cleveland Browns are starting their fifth different quarterback in the last five games. McCown's not in there. RG three's probably done for the season. Fifth different quarterback in the last five games. That's unbelievable. That's ridiculous. Miami is going to clobber the Cleveland Browns at home. They're going to run on them. Even if it's only Jay Ajayi, if uh, Arian Foster's not ready to go, doesn't matter. Ryan Tannehill's going to have a field day on this Cleveland secondary. Sure, he probably throws a pick, but you know what? Whatever. I think Tannehill's going to have a huge, huge week. Miami beats Cleveland soundly at home. Miami's favored by 10 points on the line here. Take Miami minus 10. I know it's double digits. I know what I usually say. Shut up. 
take Miami minus 10 because that's the way this game is going to go. The total in this game is 41 and a half. Take the over. I have no faith in the Cleveland defense whatsoever. They should have beaten Baltimore last week. Should have beaten Baltimore last week and they didn't. They mucked it up because that's what the Cleveland Browns do. So Miami straight up Miami minus 10 on the line over 41 and a half. Take Vegas's money on this game. Uh, that said, Miami might want to figure out a way to stop Isaiah Crowell and Duke Johnson because those players are good. The silver pick where I am 2-0 and straight up, 2-0 and against the spread, and 1-1 one and one over under so far this season sees the Chicago Bears travel to Dallas to take on the Cowboys. I love Dallas in this game for one primary reason. I look at all those injuries, all those injuries on Chicago, including the one that scares me the most, which, you know, some people might chuckle at, is Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler with a hand injury. It forced him out of the game last night on Monday night against Philadelphia. And now they've got to travel to Dallas. And that offensive line is unbelievable. Look, Chicago's pass rush is good. I mean, they showed last night that they're good. But that's the one of the best offensive lines in football. So it's going to be hard to get to Dak Prescott. Maybe they're going to be able to bottle Ezekiel Elliott up, which, by the way, let me just, I'm just going to do the old Barry Horowitz patting myself on the back about Ezekiel Elliott. He lost two fumbles in week two, or he had two fumbles. He put the ball on the ground twice in week two, and they yanked him, and they brought Alfred Morris in. That is a full-blown running back by committee. So for everybody that drafted Ezekiel Elliott in the first round of your fantasy drafts, I hate to say I told you so, but, you know, a a tota so, as the Trailer Park Boys would say. Though I do love how the Cowboys coaching staff came out and said, oh, we're not, we're not concerned about Ezekiel Elliott's fumbles. Like, yeah, sure. He's putting up Cedric Benson-like numbers in the first two weeks, but you're not concerned about the fact that he put the ball on the ground twice against the Redskins. Anyway, I like Dallas here just as an overall offense. Dak Prescott has been very impressive to me in the first two weeks. Chicago, again, if they're without Jay Cutler, Brian Hoyer's the backup. Brian Hoyer is a capable NFL backup quarterback. Dallas's defense can do some damage on that guy. And I think will, to be perfectly honest. Even if Cutler's in there, Cutler will probably be playing limited because it's a quote-unquote short week. I like Dallas all day in this one. They've got the tools. They're going to win this game. Dallas beats Chicago in Dallas for my silver pick. On the line, Dallas is favored by 7.5 points at home. I'm going to take that. Even though it's over a touchdown, I think Dallas is going to be able to put up points. Dak Prescott, he's passed the eye test as far as I'm concerned. This guy can get it done at the NFL level. He is a starting quarterback in the making here. Dallas minus seven and a half. I like that. Dallas straight up. 45 and a half is the total in this game. I'm actually going to tell you to take the under on this one just because, again, we don't know what's going to happen with Chicago's offense, whether it's going to be Cutler back there or whether it's going to be Brian Hoyer. If it is Brian Hoyer, it's going to be a primarily running offense for Chicago, Jeremy Langford, and he's probably not going to find a ton of room out there against Dallas's front seven. So I like under 45 and a half. I like Dallas minus seven and a half and Dallas straight up to beat Chicago for the silver pick. My gold pick where I am two and zero straight up one and one against the spread and one and one over under sees the Detroit Lions travel to Green Bay into Lambeau Field to play Aaron Rodgers and the Patriots. I love Green Bay in this game. The reason being, I don't think Green Bay's pass offense can be this bad for a third week in a row. I expect Aaron Rodgers is going to blow up in this game. It's got nothing to do with Detroit as a team. It's just, it's me playing the percentages. Aaron Rodgers can't continue to be this bad three games in a row. Because let's face it, we can't sugarcoat it. Aaron Rodgers has been kind of bad these two games. I mean, it's two winnable games for him that, you know, they only won one of, and that one game was only by four points against Jacksonville. So Green Bay should be playing better through the air than they are. 
And I think that turns around this week. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to have a strong game because he, again, law of averages can't have three bad games in a row. Here's an interesting stat for you. During Aaron Rodgers' career as a starting quarterback, the last time that Green Bay lost two games in a row with one of them being at home, it's only happened twice in his career. Now, it happened last season, but it's only happened twice. It was his first season as a starter and then last season. Do we think that's going to happen two seasons in a row if it's only happened twice through his entire career? Another stat, Aaron Rodgers against Detroit in his career as a starting quarterback is 10 and 3. I like those numbers. Look, Matt Stafford has played very well this season. He and I and I even said before the beginning of the season Matt Stafford was being criminally underrated in terms of fantasy. And Detroit, they're just shy of being a top 10 offense in terms of scoring. In terms of passing, they are in the top 10. In terms of their run game, their run game, they're also in the top 10. This is a top 10 offense basically any way you slice it. Detroit's going to get their points. I just like Green Bay situationally where it's in Green Bay. Aaron Rodgers incredibly good at home. I'm going to take the Rodgers factor, the fantasy cheat code, the NFL cheat code, whatever you want to call it. I like Aaron Rodgers and Green Bay. In this game, Green Bay beats Detroit. On the line, however, Detroit is an eight-point underdog on the road. Here's another fun stat for you. If you put their last 10 head-to-head matchups with that line of Detroit plus eight, Detroit covers that spread 70% of the time. I like those numbers too. That's why I'm going to take that. Detroit plus eight at Green Bay on the line. Because look, This is a game Detroit could win. I could be totally wrong about the bets that I'm making on Aaron Rodgers and on Green Bay not putting up back-to-back stinkers because it doesn't tend to happen with Aaron Rodgers. I could end up being wrong about that. It just happened last season. So it could happen again this season. Detroit plus eight, eight points to me is too many because it's a game that Detroit could win. So sure, am I hedging my bets there a little bit? You bet I am. I don't think Detroit's going to win this game, but I think eight points is too many. I think Detroit can keep this game close enough with the offense that they have. Green Bay straight up, but Detroit plus eight. Total in this game is 48. You know what? It's a coin flip. I'm going to tell you to go over just because I think these two teams are going to put up a lot of points. But it's a coin flip. I'm not going to argue with you if you want to take under 48 in that game just because it is a relatively high number. It's a coin flip. I'm going to go over based on the two offenses. I figure Green Bay has got to get it going through the air sooner rather than later. I think that happens this week. So, Green Bay over Detroit. Detroit plus 8 on the line. And over 48. That's the gold pick. And the platinum pick where I am 2-0 and straight up and 1-1 and over under, but I'm 0-2 against the spread. I've missed twice on the platinum pick. My platinum pick sees the only game we haven't talked about, San Diego traveling to Indianapolis to take on the Colts. I know there are several other YouTube prognosticators who have made this kind of their lock of the week, like their top game. Indianapolis has to win this game because there's no way There is no way, write it down, remember who said it. There is no way that the Indianapolis Colts make the playoffs if they start the season 0-3. Jacksonville's going to turn it around. Houston's already two games up on them. There are other 2-0 teams in the AFC who are going to monopolize those wildcard spots. The Bengals at 1-1 and one are going to turn it around. The Jets at 1-1 one and one are dangerous. The Chiefs at 1-1, one and one, the Raiders at 1-1 one and one are dangerous. If the Colts start the season 0-3, you might as well tank. You might as well tank. Plus, you know Keenan Allen's out for the season, and now Danny Woodhead's out for the season. That makes Travis Benjamin hugely valuable in fantasy if you can get him get him that makes melvin gordon hugely valuable in fantasy if you can trade for him trade for him 
San Diego is going to put up their points in this game. They've put up 65 points in two games. Indianapolis has only put up 55, but they've given up 73. The Chargers don't play great defense, especially on the road. This has all the makings for a wild game. I just like the Colts because they're at home and they have to win. They absolutely 100% have to win. What do you guys think? Do you think the Colts have to win in order to make the playoffs? Do you think they make the playoffs after starting 0-3? I certainly don't, but do you? Let me know in the comments section below. I like the Colts straight up to beat the Chargers in Indianapolis. On the line, the Colts are only favored by 2.5 points. I will take that because it's not very much to give up. So, Colts straight up, Colts minus 2.5. The over-under in this game, the total is 51 and a half. I'm going to tell you to go over on that one because it's two good offenses, even though San Diego is just absolutely crippled. Look, if Phillip Rivers gets hurt, again, like I said with Indianapolis, you might as well tank. If Phillip Rivers gets hurt this season, you might as well tank, get the best draft pick you possibly can, and look forward to next season. But Colts straight up, Colts minus two and a half, over 51 and a half. That's the platinum pick. And come on, Indianapolis, you have to win this game. All right, folks, those are the picks for week three, 2016-2017 NFL regular season. Those are the picks, the regular picks, the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. It's time for the comment of the week, the fan favorite comment of the week segment. And for this one, for the first time, we're going to go to SoundCloud. My first SoundCloud commenter is Trevor Rankin. And he is going to get all the love this week for the comment of the week. He actually made two comments on the week two episode. Uh, The first one, we're talking about the running back by committee that I talked about in terms of, uh, certainly in terms of like Baltimore and things like that. Not really liking the running back by committee approach. What he said was, to answer the running back question, I think it depends on who's in the backfield. If it's AP, he's your guy. In Baltimore's situation, a committee is the best option. Excellent point. I responded to that with, again, you're probably right. I just don't like the running back by committee approach as a matter of principle. But that is an excellent point. It is 100% dependent on who is in your backfield. So, you know, Dallas, take note. But he also said, I like your stuff, but the Vikings game will be closer than you think and their defense is much better than Green Bay's. And I was like, hey, you know what? He nailed it right on the head right there. Very impressive performance by the Vikings in Week 2. And as I had mentioned earlier in the in this episode, they're getting disrespected on the line this week with Carolina being 7.5-point favorites in that game. I think that's criminal. I think Minnesota will win you a lot of money this week if you go for it. But shout out and thank you, Trevor Rankin, for being my first SoundCloud commenter you get the comment of the week from week two. All right, folks, I think we ran a little bit long this week, so we're going to get you out of here on my CFL picks for week 14 in the Canadian Football League season. I've got Ottawa at home beating Toronto. I've got BC on the road beating Edmonton. I've got Winnipeg on the road beating Calgary. Calgary is already guaranteed a playoff spot. They've got nothing to play for. And I've got Hamilton on the road beating Saskatchewan. Now, last week I was only 1-3 and three picking the CFL, which means I'm only 6-6 six and six on the season. But we're going to be 10-6 and six after this week. So Ottawa, BC, Winnipeg, and Hamilton, those are my CFL picks for week 14. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. Let me just take a second to point out that so far on the season, we're up on YouTube, we're up 35 subscribers, that's awesome, mint right there, and we have nearly 500 hours of watch or listen time across all of the episodes so far, and that's that's just incredible. Also, on SoundCloud, we're now up to 28 subscribers on SoundCloud. We've had 67 plays on SoundCloud across all the episodes so far this season. That is also unbelievable. Thank you to the new YouTube subscribers. Thank you to the classic YouTube subscribers, the folks that have been with me for years. I love y'all. If I could send y'all Christmas cards, I would. Thank you to the new subscribers on SoundCloud, everyone who's caught the show on SoundCloud and on iTunes. Thank you very much for making this, thus far, one of my most successful seasons ever. Week three is in the books. I hope you enjoyed it, even though we ran a little long. And I'll see you again in week four. 